Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Kalamea. And I'm Amy Gosha. Welcome to The Divorce at Altitude, a podcast on Colorado family law. Divorce is not easy. It really sucks. Trust me, I know. Besides being an experienced divorce attorney, I'm also a divorce client. Whether you are someone considering divorce or a fellow family law attorney, listen in for weekly tips and insight into topics related to divorce, co-parenting, and separation in Colorado. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Divorce at Altitude. I'm Amy Gosha, and my co-host Ryan Kalamea is not with us today, but I am here, and I'm very privileged to be interviewing one of my really good um, close friends, soon to be family members, um, Dr. Susan Dara. Um, today, we'll, we're going to be talking about um, health and wellness um, and how to deal with that when you're going through a divorce. Um, I've mentioned this before on our podcast. Um, you know, I've gone through divorce. My divorce was final recently. Um, and I think there's a lot of things I could do to uh, manage the stress and health aspects. Um, so we're going to go through those today with um, a professional. Um, um, welcome, Susan. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Are you excited about um, talking about wellness on on a podcast? Uh, yeah, I love talking about wellness. And usually people don't like to listen to me. So I have a captive audience. Yeah. And you're also like a big podcast listener, aren't you? Yeah, all the time. Almost Everything I do, I listen to the podcast while I'm doing it. So this is my first time on one. And I'm pretty excited. Oh, we're really excited to have you. So I just wanted to give everyone a background as to um, you know who you are. So you um, recently moved to Colorado. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. When did you move back here? I moved here just before the holidays. Uh, my partner and I, your brother, um, moved to be closer to family and friends, and we moved right before the. Christmas holidays. Oh, great. Where did you move from? We were living in Boston for the five years prior, but we did take a little interim between Boston and Denver. Yeah. So we'll talk, we'll get into what you did, um, you know, in, uh, for those few months, it's really exciting, you know, what you guys did. Can you just tell me a little bit of um, background about, you know, your training and, um, you know, where you went to medical school and what you've done as an anesthesiologist? Sure. So um, I'm originally from Colorado. I'm a native, but I left to go to undergraduate school in Richmond, Virginia, where I played Division One soccer. I then took a year off and did AmeriCorps in California. I went to medical school in New York for four years and then went to residency at USC in Southern California. Got my first job in Southern California and then moved uh, to date your brother. And so I moved to Boston where I worked for the next five years at Massachusetts Ioneer, which is part of a big conglomerate called MGH and Brigham. And a couple of years into working there, they asked me to be the medical director of the surgery center, which was a pretty big uh, promotion pretty early in my career. And I had a great time working there, but then uh, John and I decided that it was a good time to move and be closer to family and kind of settled down our roots. So we moved back home to Colorado. So tell me about um, your big um, excursion that you took for a few months prior to coming and moving back to Colorado. Um, as a physician, it's really hard to take a long period of time off. So between transitioning from my Boston job to my Colorado job, I took a sabbatical for two months, and John and I sailed down the coast, um, the east coast, from Boston to Florida, and then through the Bahamas. So we had a bit of an adventure. That's great. So what was that like, um, you know, for you physically and mentally? Uh, I have to say that my first time sailing was this trip. We had captains with us for the first month as we sailed down the coast, and they left us in Florida, and then we were on our own in the Bahamas. And it was extremely stressful. I was doing a new activity with pretty high stakes. Uh, there's a big expensive vessel you're on and two human lives. So it was pretty stressful. I woke up in the middle of the night, multiple nights, uh, you know, worrying that I hadn't calculated the tides right or the weather had changed. And um, it was, I would say, one of the more stressful periods of my life, but also an amazing experience. 
That's great. And you became essentially the captain of the boat. Is that correct? Yeah. So my partner was working full time while we were there and I became the sailor. So I went from zero kind of experience and knowledge to full captain of a 55 foot sailboat. And it was a pretty steep learning curve and also an amazing experience at the same time. It's not often in our adult lives that we actually get to learn new skills. So I thought that was pretty, pretty special. Yeah, that's really, really cool. So today, uh, you know, as we talked about, we're going to be discussing wellness um, and divorce. Um, And, you know, as you know, I I just recently completed my divorce. I have a two-year-old, you know, and my experience so far as a single parent is, you know, it is kind of hard to, you know, put to eat healthy and to, you know, like, to find time to exercise, you know, usually I'll take Hunter, put him in the stroller and like do my run. So everything that I do is kind of around, you know, my child and um, who doesn't like, you know, like small food that's like cut up, you know, in pieces. So I, you know, I love, you know, snacks. It's really easy to, you know, eat what he's eating and it's not always, you know, the healthiest. Um, You know, I I joke with people how they talk about the divorce diet. which means, you know, you're going through stress, so you might not be able to eat. Um, so you end up losing weight. And I just joke how that didn't happen to me. And one of my previous clients uh, told me, well, Amy, that's because you're a divorce and dirty and you already know what to expect. So I kind of <laughs> wish I would have gone, you know, <laughs> gone through that divorce diet to get that extra, you know, baby weight off. But, <laughs> you know, it's not a funny, you know, it, you know, I say that, um, jokingly, but it is, you know, it is a real thing that people go through divorces, you know, a major life changing event is and is super stressful. Um, so today we're going to get your expert advice as to what are the things that we can do in kind of the four core areas, sleep, exercise, diet, and sunshine and nature to really balance out, um, you know, your life going through a major, you know, stressful event. Um, so we're really excited to have you today. And um, I'd like to start out with, um, you know, we have Eric Wolf, who I'm going to give you a scenario where he just came out and, you know, he's embarking on a divorce. Um, You know, he, he came to you and he's asking about, you know, what, what are some, what's some advice that you have regarding sleep? So if you could talk to us, Dr. Dara, about, um, you know, what you would recommend regarding sleep when someone's going through a stressful period, such as um, a divorce. Uh, Of course. So sleep is extremely important for everyone. Um, And in particular, when you're going through a stressful time, having a normal sleep schedule and getting good sleep every night can really improve your mood and your body's ability to react to stress and your overall well-being. Uh, There's a ton of studies about um, the lack of sleep and many things that you can see with decreased sleep or a poor sleep schedule are increased inflammation, inflammation, increased inflammation, mood disorders, cogn- cognitive and memory deficits, health problems like hypertension, dyslipidemia, which is kind of having a lot of fat in your blood, um, coronary artery disease, weight gain, and type 2 diabetes. These things are all really, really detrimental to your health. When you get poor sleep, you get increased activity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's a big, big, fancy name. Sometimes they kind of will call it the um, HPA axis for short. And we're going to come back to this axis a lot because it's a whole cycle that gets into how your body relates to stress. So when this axis is getting overworked, your body's going to react really poorly to stress. It's going to. release a ton of these hormones when you get stressed, as opposed to when you can calm it down, it will release fewer and your body will be able to react to stress a little bit better. So uh, one kind of really fun fact about sleep is that it's one of the biggest contributors to our health. And it's one of the things that people think about the least. There's an interesting fact that daylight savings time, uh, when we lose one hour of sleep, there's actually a significantly, statistically significantly increased risk of heart attacks on that one day. So oh, that, wow. Yeah, that one hour of missed sleep actually impacts people pretty significantly. So that's just kind of like a little fun fact, or not that fun. You guys will get to know that I'm a bit of a nerd and I like science facts, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so to have good sleep, there's a lot of things that you can do, and they're not that hard. They're things that are free. 
So that's good. And they're reasonably um, accessible to everyone. So the most important thing, number one, is to have a routine. Every night and every morning, you want to go to sleep and get up at the exact same time. It doesn't matter if it's a weekend or if you go on vacation. It doesn't matter if you drank too much last night or your kids kept you up or you were stressed from you know, anxiety of all these changes going on in your life. You always want to attempt to go to sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time. And the next thing you really want to do is use your bed only for sleep. So your bed should be kind of a shrine to sleep. You should have no electronics in there. It should be kept at a nice temperature. There's a lot of studies about this. So 65 degrees is actually the optimal temperature. I'm always cold, so that sounds freezing to me. Um, you do have a range from about 60 to 67. And if you keep that temperature, it's it's actually statistically supposed to improve your sleep. So that's pretty easy. You can just set the thermostat. Um, it's hard to remove all the electronics from the room, but as many kind of flashing lights and chargers and computers and things like that as you can get out of your room, that'll really also help kind of create this sleep shrine that you really want to have so that you can get your best sleep possible. Um, the next thing is that around evening time, about an hour before bed, you'll want to decrease your exposure to bright light and blue light. So if you really have to work late at night, they do make blue light glasses that filter out that light. Um, and you can also get lights in your house that will filter out that blue light if you want to have bright light but not be affected by the blue light, which is what really minimizes your melatonin production. And that melatonin is really important for helping you go to sleep and stay, to, stay asleep. Um, you can also try to create a bedtime routine, whether that includes, you know, having a cup of tea before you brush your teeth and maybe reading a little bit in a chair. As long as you're avoiding blue screens, bright lights, and it's a good bedtime routine, it's perfect that it can kind of teach your body that this is what I do when it's time to go to sleep. Um, I'm pretty sure that's probably hard with a two-year-old. Yeah. So one question I keep thinking about is, you know, sleep routines. Um, like for an adult, what would be like a typical routine, um, you know, that would be helpful? You mentioned, you know, sipping on tea. Like, for instance, what is your nightly routine? Um, I have to say that my best nightly routine would probably be a cup of tea and an actual physical book as opposed to a computer screen or a school. Um, although you can set your electronics to not expose you to that blue light that, that decreases your melatonin production. But just something kind of calming and a nice, calm evening is probably a perfect night. Great. Um, and the other question I have is, um, you said you try to sleep, you know, like go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. What, it, what, what would your recommendation be for if you just can't seem to get to sleep? Um, so if you can't seem to get to sleep, there's, a, you know, some things you can do. You can get up and get actually out of bed, maybe for 20 minutes or so, and do a calming activity in low light away from, you know, any kind of stimulating things. Um, good activities would be reading a book. Um, some people have coloring, adult coloring books where you kind of uh, color. Anything that's a reasonably calming activity. And you do that for just about 20 minutes and then get back into bed. And there's likely, if you're having sleep disorder, there's going to be a period of time when you have trouble either falling asleep or staying asleep. But if you continue to get up in the morning at the same time and then do a couple of the other steps we're going to talk about, over time, you should start to get into a routine where you can actually fall asleep at night. Great. Um, so and some other things you could do are avoid eating large meals right before bedtime. And that can be hard. I know I get really hungry right at night. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't eat anything, but tea is a good option or kind of a light snack, of, you know, low calorie, easy to digest foods. And um, another one is to avoid caffeine and alcohol at least four to six hours before bed. And I know that's really hard for a lot of people. A lot of people like to have a glass of wine with dinner. Um, and I think that's okay, but if you notice that it's affecting your sleep habits, your ability to fall asleep, or with alcohol, more likely your ability to stay asleep, um, you may want to avoid alcohol when you can. So it doesn't mean you never drink. It just means that you're conscious that that may affect your sleep cycle. And does alcohol affect your sleep cycle because of how it metabolizes or 
Yeah, you basically get this rebound effect and it affects a lot of people kind of um, maybe six hours to eight hours after they drink and they may kind of get this um, racing heart running mind. And it also changes your ability to get into REM sleep so that you're in your lighter sleep where you're able to wake up a little bit easier. And so those are the things you want to avoid. So I know for myself, when I have a couple of drinks before bed, I almost always wake up in the middle of the night. It's something I know. It doesn't mean I never drink. It's just that I'm very conscious about it. And if I have a big day the next day, I'm probably not going to have anything to drink because I want a good night's sleep. Yeah. And I'm sure that someone going through a divorce, a lot of times you hear people say, oh, I just need that glass of wine. But so that's probably something that could be contributing to a sleep issue or you know difficulty. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, alcohol may help you fall asleep, but staying asleep is where it's really kind of a trigger. Interesting. That's good to know. Great. Uh, some other things you could do are exercise daily. Um, so that actually can improve your sleep at night. Although some studies suggest that really strenuous exercise within an hour or two before your kind of bedtime may not help you fall asleep. It may kind of get you a little um, wired up. So you can exercise, but try to do it a little bit, you know, maybe an hour or two before bedtime, at least. Okay. And, you know, if sleep continues to be a problem, you can always start to keep a sleep diary. And that'll help you kind of maybe track what things trigger you. So I know for me, alcohol is a big trigger. Um, I'm also pretty affected by uh, caffeine. So I suggested four to six hours. But for me, I avoid caffeine after noon because it will really keep me up all night. I'm pretty sensitive to it. Yeah. And then what about, um, do, do some people need more sleep than others? Do you start figuring out how much sleep you really need if you put yourself on a schedule? Yeah. If you put yourself on a schedule, um, at some point in time, you'll start to just wake up naturally in the morning, even maybe before your alarm clock. So, uh, the average is around eight hours, which is kind of what we think, but it's from seven hours to nine hours for most adults between the age of around 23 and 64. So that's kind of our big window of divorce, as I would say. Yeah. And it's also very variable. I swear your mom and my brother or your brother and your mom only need like four hours of sleep and they're highly functional. I'm closer to nine. So everyone's got their own individual amount they like to sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely closer to that probably eight. And I definitely know my law partner, Ryan, he, he doesn't require as much sleep. So it is interesting how different people require different amounts of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, did you have any other um, suggestions related to sleep or should we segue into exercise? No, nope, that's everything I have about sleep. Okay, great. So, you know, one thing that, you know, we, we hear all the time, not just going through divorce, but you know, you need to exercise. Can you talk about how exercise can help with stress? Sure. So exercise and stress are very, very tightly um, correlated. So there's some thoughts about why this is, and there's a ton of studies on how correlated they are. So increased exercise, and we're talking about aerobic exercise, which is when you get your heart racing a little bit, and can decrease anxiety, decrease depression, um, decrease a negative mood, and also decrease some social withdrawal that some people experience. It also boosts self-esteem and improves cognitive function, both your kind of memory and also sharper thinking. These are all good things. That's probably why everyone tells you to exercise. They say exercise is actually the best antidepressant on the market. It's just free, so it doesn't get quite the um, pharmaceutical dollars that the medications get. Uh, there's a, a lot of reasons why they think that exercise might help us with our mood. Um, one is increased uh, blood circulation to the brain. So as you exercise, you're getting extra blood circulation everywhere. It circulates to get it to your heart, but it's going to go everywhere as well. When you get this increased blood circulation to the brain, there's a couple of effects that happen. And I'm going to go back to that um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that I talked about before. And so basically, this is your whole stress system in your brain. And your hypothalamus triggers the release of CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone, which you never need to know the name of. And that activates your pituitary gland, which then releases ACTH, which is carried by the blood to the adrenal gland. And the ultimate thing is that you get all these stress hormones and they get released in your body. 
So when you do things like get good sleep that we talked about and exercise, what happens is when you get stressed, that whole system is dampened. And instead of releasing a ton of hormones, it's a more moderate number of hormones. And so when you're stressed, you're able to kind of handle it a lot better. And there's a ton of studies that show that when you exercise, you can kind of control this system a little bit better. And one question I have, Dr. Dara, is if you have a choice with like, you know, on the hierarchy of sleep versus exercise, is there one that's more important or no? No, there's not really. Uh, I mean, exercise was in our list of things to really help you with good sleep. So um, I think that you could argue for both. And when we're talking about exercise, you don't need to go out for hours a day. It's just 20 to 30 minutes of really getting your heart racing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the truth is most of us have that amount of time. Right. The motivation to go get the heart racing, that's the harder thing to find. Yeah, that's the harder part of it, right? Yeah. Um, There's some other things that you can see with uh, exercise. There's also um, increased neural growth. So your brain is able to make these new connections um, and also decreased inflammation, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive could kind of think of exercise potentially causing inflammation. But um, globally, there's less inflammation in your body when you're working out. And all of these things lead you to feel better. And then the last thing is, I got to say, I know people hate working out. But if you ever get to the point where you're in shape enough to like working out, you will get this huge benefit of these endorphins that get released. And that's the so-called runner's high. So You know, it's going to take a little while to get there. But if you ever get there, then working out actually physically makes you feel better because you have all these feel good little hormones floating around your bloodstream. Yeah. And that can make you feel better about yourself and more confident and probably clear your mind to think more clearly about the daunting situation, you know, that a person would be in for divorce. A hundred percent. And yeah, so when I said just maybe 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, and there's a definition of what aerobic exercise is. So aerobic by the textbook just means that it requires free oxygen. And when your body needs more oxygen, basically what it will do is pump more blood around and you'll potentially breathe faster. So you want to get your heart racing and you want to have to do a little extra work breathing. And if you're doing those two things, then you have aerobic exercise. You can also quantify it if you're a numbers person like I am. I'm a science and math kid. I've got a, you know, a fitness tracker. So you want to aim for about 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. And there's a bunch of calculations that go into that. Um, The easiest one is 220 minus your age is your maximum heart rate. And then you have to do a little math to get to 70 to 80% of that. Um, We do live in Colorado. We live at altitude. So when you live at altitude, you actually uh, will, your maximum heart rate will be lower. So your goal might be, Um, uh, it might be a little bit harder to get to the numbers that you see in the textbooks just because we live at this low altitude. Right. I'm still trying to acclimate here. So I think the thing that really resonated with me was when you said that um, like it's the number one way to reduce like depression. Um, And is that just because it create, it gets rid of those stress hormones? Yeah, so it gets rid of those stress hormones and it gives you those feel good things that you might be a little bit low on if you're having depression, either from a real cause that should cause maybe you to feel sad or, you know, a little bit of a chemical change in your brain, which is also something that a lot of people suffer from in the world these days. Yeah, you also mentioned um, decrease in inflammation. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important for, um, decrease in inflammation, like what, how, what kind of physical benefits is there? So inflammation is kind of this big buzzword in the uh, health community these days. Uh, Tom Brady is always trying to decrease inflammation. Um, plenty of people are on the anti-inflammatory alkaline diet. There's a lot of people who want to decrease inflammation, and they're probably all more or less on the right track. So your inflammation can affect every part of your body. So it can affect your joints and make you feel pain. Um, It can cause just myalgias. It can make you more tired. Inflammation is very, very closely correlated with um, kind of a brain fog. 
and over time leads to increased um, incidences of early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. It's kind of like an overarching thing that inflammation is our body's ability to kind of fight disease. And you want your body to be able to do that, but not when there's no disease, then it's just fighting itself. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, well, did you have any uh, further comments on exercise um, before we move to diet? Cause I know that that's kind of the third really important area. Um, no, yeah, we can move to diet. Okay. So um, what are your recommendations, um, you know, to Eric Wolf regarding his diet? Like what can he do to improve his diet during this daunting divorce process? So there's no perfect diet. And I think a lot of people who do research into how to eat actually hate the word diet in terms of it being an activity. I'm on a diet. Um, diet as a descriptor of what you're eating is a great word. And um, I've read a fair number of books about you know, the best way to eat. And I'm not going to tell you that there's one way to eat. If you love to follow the Atkins diet and eat bacon, and if that's what's going to make you feel good, then I think you should do that, especially in this period of stress. But I have done, you know, a bit of research. And so I'll just tell you kind of my summary. One of my favorite authors on, you know, ways to eat and the reasons why we eat the way we do is Michael Pollan. He um, has written a number of books, and I'll pretty much read anything he writes because he's an excellent author. He takes kind of scientific jargon and boring facts and makes them sound interesting. So if you ever want a good read about nutrition, pick up anything. Or if you want to read about psychedelics and LSD, he has a book on that. He's got a books on everything. Um, but he has a saying that a lot of people know, and it's eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And if you eat that way, you'll eat healthy. Uh, it's not easy. It's actually harder than it sounds. But it, I think it's really some of the best advice that you can get about eating. Um, and some of these things can be hard to do. That's why I got to this kind of later in our conversation, because I think some of the active changes about choosing to do exercise and choosing to sleep can be a little bit easier. Eating real food, not too much, mostly plants, is actually pretty time intensive. And a lot of people going through divorce may not have this time to devote, um, but I'll kind of break it down. So the first part says eat food. And that sounds simple, right, Amy? Yes, it does. But it just... when we say food, we don't mean anything. We mean real food. And there's a lot of ways to think about it, but mostly it's just non-processed food, not from a factory, real food. So as close to its natural state as possible. And there's a couple ways to think about it. If your grandma or your great grandma maybe would recognize that as food, it's food. And if she would say like, I don't know what a cheesy gordita crunch is or what Cheetos are, like that's probably not food. Yeah. She knew what an apple was. She knew what an orange was. She knew what a cut of steak was. These are, these are food, right? Right. So with shopping, like you don't need to read every label because it probably shouldn't be in a package. Yeah. If probably... you can avoid a package, then that's amazing. Now, oh, okay. some, people, you know, some people can't go to the grocery store and get fresh food all the time. Um, and if you do need to get packaged food, then you may want to look at the label. And it's good to try to aim for foods with less than five ingredients. And those aren't ingredients that you have to look up the name or they sound like some sort of a chemical. They're like real foods that you have heard of. So if you yeah. find things that are packaged like that, then those are good choices, I think. I like that where it's buy foods, not in a package, but if it's in a package, less than five ingredients that you actually know what it is. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what you want to like think of when you think of food. And if you want two books that really go into this from Michael Pollan, um, there's some book called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And that really breaks down the different kind of foods um, from you know, your fast food to your local sustainable farm um, or in defense of food. And these are really, really good books that I've read. And I think a lot of people have read Probably many of you listening have already read, but I think they're really good and they kind of break it down for you. That's great. Yeah, great, great suggestion. And the next step is not too much. This part's a lot harder, I think. So um, evolutionarily, we're primed to eat. We had hunter-gatherer ancestors, um, and they maybe didn't know when their next meal was going to come, whether they were going to you know, catch an animal or find more berries. And... Um, as a result, over, over generations and generations, our bodies have developed to want to eat and to want to eat constantly. 
And it's only been kind of this modern abundance of food is a relatively short part of our human historical evolution. And so what we have now is not actually very, um, our evolution is not very beneficial for our current society. So um, I have like kind of a funny anecdote about a child about your son's age. Yeah. His parents were pretty strict. I don't know if strict's the right word, very health conscious. Yeah. This kid ate just fruits and vegetables for the first year and a half of his life. Wow. Yeah. So really healthy. I mean, they, that kid ate better than everyone I know. Yeah. And they went on vacation. And when they went on vacation, they bought some cereal puffs, something that they could bring that way. If the kid was hungry, they would have something available to give right away. Right. And we all went out to lunch shortly after they came back from vacation. And the kid was happily eating his mashed avocado and sweet potato and all the like nice healthy foods that his parents had provided. And the mom got something out of her bag and in getting something out of her bag, she took out this little can of cereal puffs. And this kid who couldn't talk and couldn't, you know, communicate and wasn't influenced by all of our, you know, diet society stopped eating everything in front of him. And, you know, all this kid wanted was those cereal puffs. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So these kind of um, simple sugars, our bodies are obsessed with them. So it's, right. not, it's not your fault if you love, you know, crackers and chips, our bodies or cookies, whatever your thing is, our bodies are like designed to crave that simple sugar. Um, but then we have a problem because when you eat simple sugars, then your blood sugar goes super high. Right. And then your insulin goes super high which causes your blood sugar to crash, which tells your brain, I need more food. So it's this kind of cycle. So when we live in the society where all these simple carbs are so easy to come by, it makes it feel almost impossible to eat not too much food. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you is it probably really affects energy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So what you eat completely affects your energy. The sugar crash is not just the thing you see in kids after their Halloween candy bag. It's a real thing. I get it. If I have a cookie, I just crash. But, um, you know, it happens to everyone. And diabetics know this more than anyone else because their insulin response is Mm -hmm. blunted over time. Um, But there are things that we can do to help it and to kind of keep our energy at a more stable level and to avoid this kind of sugar roller coaster that a lot of us get stuck on when we eat the modern American diet. And what you really want to do is just have protein at every meal. And then if you're going to have carbs, which I love carbs, you want to avoid the simple carbs, like your white bread and crackers. And you want to eat complex carbs and whole grains. So if you do that, instead of you'll still go up and down, but it'll be a much more casual roller coaster. And not this like kind of frightening one where you feel like you're not wearing a seatbelt and you're fully not in charge. Yeah. And when you are going through divorce, you need that energy to not only maintain your life if you have kids, but yeah, to keep that even, that that would be really helpful. I mean, you have so much going on when you're stressed from a divorce. Yeah. On top of all the stress, you actually just have paperwork and and all sorts of kind of extra things that have gotten added into your schedule. So if you can kind of make the eating thing a little bit easier, I think that can help. Yeah. Um, And then the last part is mostly plants. And I'm not going to tell you not to eat any meat. I eat meat. I like meat. Um, But plants are our most nutrient dense foods. So those are the foods that are really going to give you the most bang for your buck. And they're also going to give you all these nutrients that we that we need. And we're not getting from our processed food. Uh, It's kind of like a, a fun fact, but broccoli actually contains more protein per calorie than steak. So really? Yeah. I mean, you'd have to eat a ton of broccoli and you'd be super gassy, but, you know, technically you could really get there. Um, and spinach per calorie, again, is equivalent to chicken or fish. So really getting a lot of vegetables into your diet, um, green leafy vegetables in particular, and then having a rainbow on your plate will get you all of these like vitamins, mineral, minerals, antioxidants, and things that are really important. And you could go and take supplements and you could take a multivitamin and that'll help. But there are actually differences in the way our body digests a a meal. So if you take an omega versus eating a fish, you're actually going to get a totally different benefit from the fish as opposed to the omega supplement. 
Now, if you hate fish and you need omegas, take an omega all day, but you know. Does it matter if you take a bunch of spinach and put it into like, you know, a blender and like do a smoothie or is that okay? No, that's exactly how I get a lot of my greens. Um, okay. Sometimes I try, try to challenge myself to have two meals of leafy greens and it's actually really, really hard. But if you can get one in with breakfast and get a whole salad worth of spinach in your smoothie and hide it under a banana and some berries, that's a, like a super smart way. And I know you make smoothies for a hunter all the time. Yeah. So I'm always a little jealous of his smoothies, but that's an awesome way to get vegetables in. You can sneak them in for your kids or for your school. So I think that's an awesome way to do it. Or even for myself because yeah. it's hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's almost harder for adults to eat these green leafy vegetables. I do. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, well, that's great. Um, I think let's turn to the kind of last big pillar topic, sunshine and nature. Can you talk to us about um, what we can do with sunshine and nature to get less stressed? Of course. So we live in Colorado and we are blessed because we have so much sunshine here and we have easy access to nature. This is a great place for this and it's you know mostly free. I get that not everyone's schedule can accommodate getting into um, nature and sunshine, it has a super big impact on your well-being. Um, so it increases mood. There's a reason we call it a sunny disposition. It's not necessarily just that, you know, you seem bright and sunshiny. It's actually when the weather's better, people are in better moods. And um, it also increases your vitamin D absorption. So a lot of Americans are deficient in vitamin D, which is free. You just have to go outside for about five to 10 minutes of sunlight a couple of times a week. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying go out and get a sunburn or expose yourself to too many harmful rays, but you can go out and get vitamin D and that decreases your inflammation, which we talked about before, uh, increases cell growth. So it's actually good for, you know, your skin and it increases strong bones. It's an important part of your kind of bone process. Um, and then you can decrease your blood pressure. So a lot of times when you're stressed, your blood pressure can rise. Uh, when the sun rays touch the skin, it releases something called nitric oxide that vasodilates and lowers your blood pressure a little bit. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's probably why we're all a little bit happier when it's sunny out. Yeah. And then it's one of the, those things that we said can help with sleep. So when you go outside and get sunlight, it actually increases your serotonin. That's your kind of happy, I feel good um, chemical that floats around your body. Um, and that can improve your melatonin production at night. So getting that, that can also help with your sleep. So if you go and run outside in the sun, boom, you got a couple of the things ticked off your list already. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just going out in nature 30 minutes, a couple of times a week um, can really improve uh, your stress, your anxiety, and your depression. And they've done a ton of studies and they really don't know why, but they did some imaging of the brain and after you go out into nature, so they did people walking in an urban setting and people walking in a kind of a nature setting, and they had um, decreased activity in the frontal cortex after they'd been outside as opposed to being in an urban setting. And that's associated with the part of the brain that malfunctions when you get stressed and leads to um, kind of continuous negative thoughts or rumination. And I can imagine that if you were going through a divorce, yes. you would just be having all of these thoughts going over and over again in your brain. And so coming outside and just being in nature for a little while can help. It's free. So why not get out there and just go get a little sunshine and a little birds chirping and, you know, yeah. green leaves or whatever. And if you yeah. can't outside, you can put nature sounds on and it's not quite as effective, I'm guessing, but it has and improves effects compared to, you know, not listening to that, that nature sound. Yeah, no, that's so interesting, because I can be prone to, yeah, the rumination. So that's good to know. Yeah, it's super hard not to be. So um, yeah, sun sunshine and getting out in nature is super, super helpful. Yeah. And like you said, Colorado has like the highest, I think we're the highest state in Col in the US that has the most sunshine days. So we are lucky. way more than where I came from in Boston. <laughs> yeah, I bet you're uh, you're looking forward to that. Um, and I know you get outside and run a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there's so much stuff that we talked about, Amy, and I think it can be overwhelming to try to do all of these things at once. 
And um, so one thing that I do that I could suggest to some of your listeners is yeah, instead of trying to change my whole life in one day, uh, I've done this for a little while now. I do little one month challenges. And so yeah, explain that to me. It's just 30 days. It's long enough that you kind of start to make a habit of your activity. And it's a limited amount of time. So it's doable. So if you if you really commit to yourself to do something for 30 days, it's a lot easier than saying, I'm going to do all of these healthy things for the rest of my life. And that's a little bit harder to kind of, for me, to wrap my head around. So each month I pick a new kind of thing to go after. And that's the thing I do. So this month I'm exercising and I exercise for a minimum of 20 minutes every day. And that might be as little as some yoga and it might be a big run or, you know, going skiing, but it's just something every single day. And my hope is that by the end of the month, I'm kind of back in exercise mode because I wasn't in it when I, you know, we moved, we had the holidays. It right. was hard. Um, so this is my challenge for this month. The next month that will be something else, but. Well, and I know there's a lot of research on ha- like habit changing or habit forming and don't, isn't the magic number like 30 days or? 28 days is uh, how long it takes to oh. have a habit. So our shortest month has 28 days. And for me, it's just easy to start on the first because then I don't have to think too much about where I am in the month. Yeah. Do you notice that um, after you've done your challenge for 30 days that you're more likely to kind of stick with it? A hundred percent. And I don't stick with it. Uh, but it does, it puts this kind of activity or kind of life-changing beneficial thing closer to the forefront of my brain. And it creates the habits that will stay with me. So, you know, one month I may try to avoid plastic silverware and single use items. And now all of a sudden I'm really good about bringing my reusable silverware and my mug to work every day so that I'm not you know, throwing a bunch of plastic away. And yeah. right now I'm in the habit of working out every day. And it actually has gotten to the point where it feels good um, getting some of those endorphins again, which was not the case when I first moved to Colorado. And it felt like I was running through sand with a sack of potatoes over my shoulder because I was not used to this altitude. But um, yeah, it's I think it's a good way to kind of break down this bigger overarching challenge that is improved health. And yeah. um, just to, you know, I think when you go through stress, and I bet divorce is very similar, time was very fast and very slow. Yes. So, you know, a year, you could have 12 new habits added to your life by doing one thing every month. And it may be yeah. you're not making a lot of progress, but you, you probably are. And over a year, you make a, a huge impact on your life. Well, and I think the thing that resonates with me is a lot of times people, it's too daunting, you know, like during a point of stress, you're just like, Oh, my God, I can't add one more thing. But it just feels a little bit more palatable to just commit to one thing to say, Okay, I'm going to set my sleep schedule, you know, I'm going to go to bed or one month, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. But yeah, that's super helpful. And I've seen you, you know, in action doing that. And it's, it's super empowering. And I think, you know, probably helps with confidence and you know, just those habit, form, you know, positive habit formations. So that's really good. Well, I think, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about related to sunshine and nature before I segue into kind of my last topic? No, 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 that's it. Okay. So I have, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, you know, I know that you're not, you're a doctor, you're not a mental health professional, but um, say that Eric, you know, he's sitting in your office, he's talked to you about, um, you know, he did joint counseling with his wife or soon to be ex-wife, Melanie, um, and he walked out of that counseling session. What, if anything, would you like tell him related to a ther- seeking a therapist or just mental health professional in general? I think we're really lucky that we live in current society where the taboo of mental health is significantly decreased to what it's been historically. But there's still this kind of stigma around mental health and seeking help. Um, right. And, you know, it sounds like he at least was already open to the idea of seeking help because he was going to a couple's counselor. And if it sounds like he could potentially benefit from more therapy. And if that's something that he's interested in, then he should go and get his own individual therapist because um, when you're looking to repair a relationship, it's good to have a couple's counselor. But when you're looking to um, 
kind of work on yourself, whether that's in conjunction with your relationship or independent of it uh, after a failed relationship or kind of the conclusion of it, you're going to want to have your own person that's kind of tailored to just you and isn't treating you in the context of your relationship. They're just treating you yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And most therapists I think would recommend finding someone separate, not right you know, from the couple's therapy. So I think that that would be something that he should honestly and seriously look into, um, especially if he's open to it. So, you know, for therapy, you have to be willing to a willing participant. Um, but it's really important. And there's a lot of ways to do therapy. You can go and do it in person. And there's, you know, online kind of things where you can text and video chat if you know, there's COVID right now, or you just don't have the time, right? Yeah. You have all these things on your plate, adding therapy, especially if you're adding it in addition to your couple's therapy, seems kind of daunting and overwhelming, but creating that little space and time to just talk about yourself with someone who's devoted to just you can be really helpful. Yeah. And I know that, you know, as a divorce attorney, a lot of times people will talk to me related to, you know, their health or mental health, other areas. I'm sure that happens to you as a doctor. So, you know, like if Eric went on and said, you know, I have children, but I want to continue dating. um, And you knew that he was going through a divorce. Do you have any recommendations for him in that regard? Yeah, that's a really hard question to uh, answer. I think bringing new people into a child's life, whether they're young or old, can be a little bit impactful on their life and the way they see relationships. So I would potentially, you know, from no sort of actual training, because I'm not a psychologist, um, advise against, you know, bringing a lot of different women or kind of new relationships into the children's life. And then I think that's something that he would probably want to kind of work with his therapist to see, you know, when's the right time to move on? Am I moving on appropriately? Are these, you know, rebounds? Are these real relationships? And then, you know, working from that basis to know when the right time is to you know, start to get into a real relationship and to expose their children to those new partners. Yeah, you pro- it probably does happen to you. It, for me, it happens where I do have to tell people like you might want to check with a mental health professional, you know, because that's not really my area of expertise. But that's exactly what I would be telling a client if, you know, Eric came to me and said, you know, I, I want to start dating, you know, I would talk to him about you know, not introducing a new relationship to the children, how that impacts the children. And then, you know, talk to your therapist about, you know, those things. Um, so yeah, I think that your, your advice would be the same as mine would be. Um, so I wanted to also wrap up with, I read a recent article um, in US News that essentially um, a, so, a sociology professor from the University of Texas in Austin, he did um, recent research um, that it says that he's found that long term there's long term health um, impacts on divorce. He found that you know the stress of divorce can um, accelerate the biological processes that cause um, or can lead to cardiovascular disease. And he also found in his sample study that mid aged um, women who are um, going through divorce, they're more likely to develop heart disease um, versus non-divorced middle-aged married women. Listening to that kind of study, um, you know, what what resonates with you? Do you think that that is something that probably would be, I don't know, viable that divorce has long-term health effects on people? A hundred percent. So divorce is in its most basic kind of measure, it's a big stressor in your life. And I think, you know, as we touched on, stress can really increase a lot of things that are unhealthy. So this inflammatory response, it can lead to some, you know, poor habits, which may lead to increased coronary artery disease, hypertension, um, and all these things can lead to heart attacks. There's also an interesting study on longevity, and you could do a million different things to try to increase your lifespan. But the one most impactful thing is to lead a non-stressed life. And they looked at telomeres, which are these little tails on the end of your DNA. And over time, as we age, those shorten. And the more stress you're exposed to, the more your telomeres shorten over time. And that's the biggest impact that they could find of everything they studied. And they studied a ton of things, eating unhealthy, um, 
you know, being happy, but stress was really the one thing that definitively caused a decrease in your telomere length over time. So, and then also, which is kind of an indicator of increased aging. So I think that this person's study was 100% correct. And there's probably more studies they could do to find even, you know, more um, weird sciencey facts if they wanted to get into some of the um, pathways in the body. But I think that that's 100% true. So it's such a stressful thing to go through. And I think that it's important to recognize that it's going to be stressful and have a big impact on your life. And do as much as you can to kind of minimize that for you, for your family, and for your longevity. Yeah. And it is um, really, I think, important to even just, you know, myself going through it to kind of normalize it and to maybe pick one thing that you that I could do on a daily basis to just improve, you know, my sleep or my eating, you know, I think, you know, that's really, really helpful. So thank you, Dr. Dara, for your time today. I really appreciate your expert advice on health um, and wellness, um, you know, especially when people are impacted um, by divorce. Um, and I will just close with um, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you want to find more um, about Ryan Kalamea or myself, Amy Gosha, you can look on our website at kalamea.law or you can email me at amy at kalamea, K-A-L-A-M-A-Y-A dot law. Thank you, Dr. Dara. Yeah, of course. That was a pleasure. Hey everyone, this is Ryan again. Thank you for joining us on Divorce at Altitude. If you found our tips, insight, or discussion helpful, please tell a friend about this podcast. For show notes, additional resources, or links mentioned on today's episode, visit divorceataltitude.com. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen in. Many of our episodes are also posted on YouTube. You can also find Amy and me at Kalamea.law or 970-315-2365. That's K-A-L-A-M-A-Y-A dot law.